Hello, this is Mark Tooley, president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy in Washington, D.C. And today we're having a Methodist conversation with the uh, founders of a new online journal called uh, Firebrand, aimed at the Wesleyan community. And I am talking with editor David Watson, who is also dean of United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio and uh, the managing editor of Firebrand, Maggie Ulmer. Unfortunately, uh, the other um, senior editor uh, could not be with us today because of uh, she, she's transitioning from one um, university to uh, Asbury Theological uh, Seminary. Hopefully Asbury University. Yeah. Asbury University. Yeah, yeah. Suzanne yeah. Nicholson is taking Suzanne a position Nicholson at Asbury, yeah, Asbury University. So uh, David, uh, tell us, so uh, what is a uh, firebrand? First of all, for the uninitiated in the Methodist world, where does the name come from? And uh, who, uh, who is the, the uh, founding genius behind this operation? <laughs> uh, who are the contributing uh, editors, writers, and uh, what are the goals, uh, intellectually and spiritually? Well, um, the name comes from from John Wesley, of course, uh, referring to himself as a brand plucked from the burning, uh, rescued from a house fire when he was a child. And because of that, he felt like he and his mother both felt like he had, uh, you know, that, that God had saved him from that fire for a special purpose. Also, you know, a firebrand is someone who uh, kind of stirs things up a little bit. And that's part of what we want to do. I mean, we don't want to cause needless controversy, but at the same time, we want to have, um, really in-depth and hard-hitting conversations about important topics uh, in the tradition. This, this idea has been cooking for a long time uh, among several of us. You know, just looking at venues like, for example, in the Roman Catholic tradition, First Things, I, I realize that uh, evangelicals also publish in First Things, um, but, but it, it's fairly um, dominated by Roman Catholics. And... Um, Word on Fire is another Roman Catholic, um, you know, kind of public forum for learning about the faith and discussion about the faith. Uh, the Gospel Coalition, uh, a reformed outlet for this kind of, it's a, it's a public venue for teaching people about the faith as they understand it. And I, you know, I, I don't want to go into competition with those groups. I mean, I applaud their effort, but for Methodists, I just thought, you know, wouldn't it be good to to start something like that, to try to get some of the best um, minds kind of in the, in the orthodox or more uh, traditionalist uh, world of Methodism and kind of bring them together for conversations, uh, taking a deep dive into our own tradition and uh, exploring what it has to offer. I've been a United Methodist all my life and I, um, I've been in a lot of churches, I've taught a lot of Methodist pastors, and it just seems to me that there is so often a lack of um, Methodist depth because we don't know our own tradition well enough. And so uh, I just wanted to make whatever contribution could be made. Matt Reynolds and I, who Heads up, Spirit of Truth began to talk about this. Matt and I have collaborated on a number of things. You know, Maggie and I and Scott Kisker are on a, a podcast called Plain Truth, a Holy Spirit podcast that's also affiliated with Spirit and Truth. And we just decided to, to go for it. Um, so, uh, you know, Maggie is, is a partner in crime on many levels. <laughs> and and uh such a bright person and such a hard worker i knew i wanted her involved from the beginning and then um i began to recruit people who i just thought would uh bring us an editorial board that was um that, that had a, a shared set of commitments but also reflected um racial and gender diversity that was important as we were putting together the board um and so uh, and we, you know, we wanted academics, but we also wanted pastors. We wanted lay people. So that's that's sort of the background of it, Mark. Is that does that get at what you're asking? It does. And so, uh, Maggie, let me ask you a little bit about your background. Where do you come from, and how did you come to be involved with 
firebrand? <laughs> um, well, actually, I, I grew up um, uh, split between the West Coast and the East Coast. And actually, I, I grew up in Northern Virginia. And um, so I'm, um, and I lived in DC for four or five years. So I love DC. Um, my, let's see, my background is in the um, nonprofit arts administration and performing arts. So I, I worked in um, performing arts theater and uh, I ran a theater company in Fairfax County and um, with two other co-founders still there. And um, yeah, so that's what my background is in. And I do a lot, I've worked a lot with writers and editing and um, just helping. I like to see my, my special sort of superhero gift as um, sort of helping ideas become real life. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I, when I first heard that, um, Firebrand, the the idea of the publication was a possibility, which is really exciting, and and I wanted to offer support in any way I could, and um, it doesn't take much to get David to uh, let people. It's like as soon as you offer even the idea of helping, it's too late. You've already had ten things assigned, <laughs> so so it, it was very delegation. hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, and I had already been involved in the podcast, you know, we're in our third season or something like that. I forget. Yeah. And, um, we're about to wrap up season three, actually. Yeah. And uh, I'm on the board at Spirit and Truth and I, I work there as well. So sort of just natural worlds colliding. <laughs> no, uh, I look at the uh, roster of writers and editors. It seems to be all the names are, at least those whom I recognize are United Methodists, but obviously you're aiming uh, to reach the wider Wesleyan and Methodist uh, community, if I understand it correctly. That's right. Um, not all of them are United Methodists. Um, we have, for example, uh, Doug Koskela is a free Methodist uh, theologian, uh, teaches at Seattle Pacific University, which is a free Methodist school. And um, let's see, Caleb Maskell uh, is, he, uh, I forget his exact title, but he oversees higher education uh, initiatives for the Vineyard. Uh, and there are others as well who, who uh, are not United Methodists. We, we have an invitation out right now for a Nazarene uh, to come on to the board. I haven't heard back on that. So, oh, and Dr. Elvin Sadler, who is General Secretary of the AME Zion, is also uh, on the board. And so uh, we wanted to reach out into the Pan Wesleyan world. And, you know, to some extent, I mean, I, I think the editorial board is mostly, at least for now, in shape, but we are still kind of forming it a little bit. I expect there to be maybe a few more additions as we, as we go forward. And so Firebrand clearly is not uh, an academic journal. You mentioned the Gospel Coalition and First Things being models of sorts. And also with those models in mind, it's not strictly a theological journal. It's also going to be addressing the topics of uh, public life and broader concern from a Wesleyan perspective. Yeah. From yeah. Uh, your stance, what do you think are the, uh, say, the top five, uh, top 10 concerns for Methodists right now, theologically and topics of uh, public life that should most urgently be addressed? I mean, the one that's right at the front right now uh, nationally is uh, we have to do a better job of addressing issues of racism. Um, that is um, uh, racism right now uh, and its after effects are tearing our country apart and we, we have to address this. We have to find ways to bring robust conversations about these topics into the public forum where we can make real progress in being in dialogue uh, with one another. Um, and so uh, we've commissioned some articles on this already uh, that we want to address. I mean, that, that seems to be in terms of American public life, kind of the number one pressing issue of national importance right now. Um, but also, you know, for example, the evangelical relationship to uh, the Republican Party and Donald Trump, uh, the so, you know, people who um, identify themselves as progressive evangelicals, 
you know, these are topics that we really need to dig down into and, and talk about. With regard to more theological topics, Mark, excuse me, um, I'd say that Methodist folks really need a much more clearly defined doctrine of scripture and a much more clearly defined ecclesiology. These are two topics that I would really uh, like to see us contribute to a public discussion on. Now, I have uh, said to your, um, Billy Abraham is sort of a mentor to you, I think it's yeah, fair to say. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I, uh, I dared to mention that in front of him one time that uh, Methodism was lacking in an intellectual tradition compared to say our Calvinist friends. And he vigorously disagreed and said, <laughs> in fact, we have a strong tradition that we've just neglected and failed to acknowledge or, or nurture. Uh, would you agree with uh, Billy Abraham on that? Is, is the tradition there? Or are we essentially starting from behind? I mean, I think I've talked with Billy about this before. And, um, you know, Billy, Billy has one kind of opinion, and it's a strong opinion. <laughs> and I think when he's talking about this, a lot of what he's talking about is going back into figures like William Burt Pope, uh, and Richard Watson, uh, I mean, he's, he's going well back into our history. And yes, there have been some excellent Methodist scholars um, over the years. But I think in terms of probing the question of what does it mean particularly to be a Methodist in this day and age, um, we have a lot of a lot of catch-up work to do. Um, it would be difficult to find agreement about that. I think it would be easier to find agreement, say, about what it means to be reformed in this day and age. Um, Methodism is a broad tradition, and we have a funny relationship to, say, evangelicalism. And so um, I do think that we have a, a good intellectual tradition but I also think we've got a lot of catch up work to do. I'm going to pose this question to Maggie, who I think is uh, younger than uh, you and I are. So uh, Maggie, uh, in terms of reaching younger Christians, um, are there particular issues that uh, Firebrand should be aiming at to um, speak to that demographic in particular? Well, <laughs> you may be overestimating my youth. <laughs> <laughs> You're young compared to me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, I think that younger people care very much about justice issues. And I, my hope is that we can provide a framework that seriously and um, with depth and compassion addresses those issues uh, without sacrificing biblical and orthodox integrity. Um, so I, I think that that is, in my mind, when, it, when you read the studies about why people or why young people in particular are leaving the church, I, I feel like you see sort of two things come up over and over again. One is just this absence of a, a narrative of justness and compassion that, that sort of stands up to uh, sort of the, the inequality that we just see all around us. Um, and really, I think that that leads to what one of the secondary issues is, is that we just have not done a good job of passing on the faith. Discipleship and catechism is in a really rough state, in my opinion in the Methodist church in particular, and, um, and maybe just generally. And uh, so I think that young people want to have hard conversations. I don't think that they're afraid to have their worldview challenged. And um, I, you know, personally, I, I'm in my 40s. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if I really, really you look very young. <laughs> thing. I appreciate that. Um, so I don't know if I really qualify as young, but I, I in my own engagement with, um, you know, people half my age, uh, you know, they're not afraid to have their worldview challenged if it's done um, with integrity and compassion. And I, I just 
think that the church should not be afraid to have those conversations and certainly shouldn't be afraid to have those conversations um, at the risk of their, uh, I feel like we, we try to protect the um, artifice of tradition too much. And do you think uh, young Christians uh, specifically care in this post denominal age about being Methodist? I mean, I, I, I think that's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that, that they know what it is. Right. Right now, Mark, the term doesn't have enough content right. to hold people in. I, uh, I have an 18 year old son and my 18 year old son um, is going to be a biochemistry major. He's going to go to Asbury University next year, but he wants depth. Mm -hmm. you know, he, anything that smacks of the kind of religion that we sometimes identify as something like moral therapeutic deism, he's right. utterly uninterested in it. It's a total yawner for him. He wants serious depth. Um, he's been educated in, in a school run by conservative Anglicans, um, Reformed Anglican Church, which I believe now is affiliated with the ACNA. And he identifies more with the Anglican tradition than with the Methodist tradition in which he was raised, you know, and he's got me for a dad. I mean, I am, I am very Methodist. I'm interested in Methodism. I, I talk about Methodism so much people get tired of it. You know, uh, Scott Kisker is always <laughs> hanging out at my house and we're talking about Methodism and, and, and yet my own son identifies more with the religion of his education. That, and it's not because we don't go to a good church. We go to a fine church. Um, I like our church, and I, I think our pastor does a great job. It's just that Methodism itself, we've not done a good enough job of marking out what that tradition mm. actually means. What do we contribute? I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, well, Methodists are people who think and let think, or Methodists are people who use scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. I mean, you've heard open all these Open hearts, open minds, open yeah. doors. Yeah. And, and these, are, these are bumper stickers at best. Absolutely. I would guess a great challenge for Firebrand will be in terms of addressing public issues, developing uh, a specific uh, Wesleyan analysis beyond just being generically uh, Christian or generically concerned about justice, for example, uh, addressing issues of race. Are there particular Wesleyan distinctives to a Christian anthropology that would help you and equip you to address issues of race uh, as a Methodist? And this, this will be true for other issues as well. Uh, do you also anticipate that might be uh, somewhat of a challenge for your writers? Um, I hope that, I think it will be a challenge. I hope they take up that challenge. That's what I want. Um, I want people to take up the challenge of having and uh, being able to address these kinds of big, big public questions in ways that draw upon the great tradition of Christian faith, first and foremost, but also our Wesleyan instantiation of it. I mean, I think that there is an article to be written uh, related to um, racism and sanctification and the healing of racism through the healing of the sin-sick soul. And now I'm, I'm probably not the person to write that article, but um, you know, I think that that's one of the, the, the Wesleyan, we're not the only ones who talk about sanctification, but we certainly emphasize sanctification. And you know, God, it's not God's intention that people harbor racial hatred or bias. It's not God's intention that um, people of color um, endure uh, systematic oppression. And so, you know, the, the healing that God offers us, uh, the healing of the world that we have through Jesus Christ, we talk about that in the Wesleyan tradition through sanctification. I think it's very much related to you know, getting to making progress in terms of the racial dynamics we're experiencing in the country right now. It's uh, my personal hope that uh, Firebrand will be uh, so successful that you will be generating uh, Methodist uh, thinkers and public voices who uh, mm. 
speak to the church and the nation beyond just the Methodist community. It's hard to think of distinctly uh, Methodist public thinkers who have been influential over the last uh, 50 or even 100 years. I, my, one of my favorites would be uh, Paul Ramsey um, yeah. from Princeton, mm -hmm. who, of course, was famous for his work on just war teaching, but also on medical ethics, but was a lifelong Methodist and uh, ordained from the Mississippi Conference. So uh, I'm sure you, you have, have that hope as well that you'll be encouraging these kinds of uh, minds to have a uh, reach a larger universe. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Um, and again, I mean, one of the questions I would ask is, um, why would people reach out to Methodist intellectuals when it's so unclear what a Methodist intellectual actually is? You know, what is the distinct contribution that that person would be able to make? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, we, we have had some, some great thinkers. I mean, I think of Stanley Hauerwas. I think he's not United Methodist anymore, but, but for a good while he was, and he taught at Duke Divinity School and made a big footprint in Methodism, you know. But you're right that scholars who kind of, Methodist intellectuals who kind of cross out into, you know, other ecclesiastical traditions are pretty few and far between. And uh, as you mentioned in terms of, uh, first things uh, where the Roman Catholic voice is uh, predominant. Uh, perhaps there's a wider issue of, um, as the great Protestant traditions have receded uh, in place of a generic evangelicalism, there's a wider crisis of uh, Protestant and evangelical uh, intellectual thought, uh, a vacuum yeah. there. That yeah. Maybe Methodists can help to fill. Yeah, and one of the groups that I really would like us to um, be able to have conversations with is um, uh, Pentecostalism. Um, and um, we did invite, uh, we, as I said, we have Caleb Maskell from the Vineyard, that's not strictly Pentecostal, on the board. We did invite another Pentecostal intellectual onto the board and she declined. Um, but, um, but we do wanna have those conversations with Pentecostals. Um, you know, Pentecostals and Methodists are first cousins. And so, uh, and Pentecostalism is, is rapidly growing all around the globe. I mean, it's flourishing. And so I think it's important for us to be in conversation with folks in the Pentecostal tradition. Um, you know, Maggie and I and Scott, we joke that our podcast is a, is a Methecostal podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that, that we Methodist folks have a lot to learn from this tradition that kind of came up out of Methodism. And, and maybe Pentecostals have something to learn from us too. And uh, obviously Pentecostalism is uh, by some counts the fastest growing uh, religious movement uh, in the world, but yeah. uh, Methodism itself is growing around the world. So no doubt you're looking for contributors from outside the United States as well to represent that growing demographic. We, we have solicited articles uh, from outside the United States, yes, and we'll continue to do that. Well, uh, David Watson and Maggie Ulmer, uh, editors and uh, founders of uh, Firebrand, thank you so much for an enjoyable conversation and look forward to following your future successes. Thank you, Mark. We appreciate the conversation. It's a pleasure.